In this video, we will learn about the most crucial important nursing skill, which is assessing vital signs. Vital signs are very critical for nurses because it can help nurses provide high quality care and help nurses in identifying data related to patient's condition, including how the patient is responding to the medical treatment and importantly, whether the patient is deteriorating or improving. There are six vital signs. Yes, six. Temperature, pulse, blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen saturation, and pain rating. Pain is also considered as sixth vital sign, which is often missed by nurses. Let's gather the supplies you need to check vital signs. So the nurse would require a stethoscope, blood pressure cuff with sphygmomanometer, thermometer, pulse oximeter, watch, disinfectant wipes, and gloves. Let's begin with hand hygiene. Perform hand hygiene and don on PPE based on your patient's precaution. So if your patient is on droplet precaution, make sure you're wearing gown, gloves, mask, and goggles. Perform identity check using two identifiers, which is name and date of birth. Always explain the patient about the procedure of collecting vital signs and address any questions or queries the patient may have. Let's begin with taking the temperature. Temperature can be checked via various methods. Oral, axillary, temporal, rectal, ear, slash tympanic. Key points to remember is that axillary and temporal temperatures will read one degree lower than the oral temperature. And rectal and ear temperature will be reading one degree higher than the oral temperature. So a normal temperature in adults is 36.1 degrees Celsius to 37.2 degrees Celsius. Alternatively, 97 Fahrenheit to 99 Fahrenheit. And a temperature greater than 100.4 is considered as fever. In degrees Celsius, means more than 38 degrees Celsius would be considered as fever. In this video, we will review the oral method of temperature checking. The oral method can be used for adults and children who are older than 5 years of age. Oral temperature checking is not recommended in children less than 5 years of age as it is hard for them to hold the thermometer under their tongue and long enough. Now carefully place the tip of the thermometer under your patient's tongue. And please ensure that thermometer tip is covered with a plastic sleeve. Carefully place the tip of the thermometer under your child's tongue. And the temperature probe should be covered with a plastic sleeve. With the patient's mouth closed, leave the thermometer in place for about one minute or until you hear the beep. Remove the thermometer and read the temperature and document it on the vital sign sheet. If you are using tympanic thermometer, the ear method is recommended for children who are older than 2 years of age or on the adults. Ear method can produce temperature readings that are incorrect even if the manufactured directions are followed. Now, we will perform oxygen saturation monitoring. This is performed with an oxygen saturation monitor. This device is placed on the nail bed of a finger and the normal oxygen saturation is 95% to 100%. Heart rates can be monitored using the nurse on stick monitor or automated devices. However, if the patient exhibits arrhythmias or dysrhythmias, it's always good to count the heart rate using manual method. You can count the heart rate in various locations like radial, brachial, carotid, pedal, or femoral arteries. So use the first three fingers of your hand and find the radial artery. It is located in the wrist right below the thumb along the radial bone. If you find it challenging, extend your hand a little bit. Note the weight, strength, and rhythm. Grade the strength of the pulse with the scale. Zero means absent. Plus one is a weak pulse. Two plus is normal. Three plus is bounding. And count the heart rate for 30 seconds and multiply by two if it's a regular rhythm. If the heart rate is irregular, it's always recommended to count the heart rate for full one minute. 
Normal heart rate in adult is 60 to 100 beats per minute. Let's review the procedure of counting respirations. Counting the respiratory rate right after counting the heart rate. To do this, keep your fingers on the radial side and look at the rate of the breathing, depth, and rhythm. The patient should not be aware that you are counting the respiratory rate. Patient can become conscious. It can alter the breathing. Count the respiration for full 30 seconds. If regular, and multiply by 2. If the respirations are irregular, count for full 1 minute. And remember, one breath in and one breath out equals to one respiration. Normal respiration rate in adults is 12 to 20 breaths per minute. So if the patient's breathing rate is less than 12, it's going to be called as bradypnea. If the patient's breathing rate is more than 20, it's called as tachypnea. It's good to remember terminology. Let's review the pain assessment. Pain assessment is crucial and vital. Pain assessment can be done using various methods. One of the methods which can be done is PQRSTU method. In PQRSTU method, the nursing student or nurses gather the data about patient's pain. P stands for provocation. What provoked the patient's pain? Q stands for quality of the pain. Quality of the pain can be described as dull, sharp, twisting, shooting, crushing, burning, or throbbing pain. R stands for radiating or region. The region of the pain can help you further understand the patient's condition. S stands for severity. Describing the severity of the pain is not enough. That's why it's important for nurses to use the pain rating scale. Nurse has to ask the patient to rate their pain on the rating scale of 0 to 10. 0 being no pain and 10 being the absolute worst pain they have ever experienced. Key points to remember. You can also use different types of pain scales. Facial pain scales can be used in pediatric patients where they cannot describe the pain on scale but they can look at the faces and describe the extent of their pain. Another method that can be used on the patients who are in vegetative stage, unconscious patients, comatose patients is the grimacing, facial expressions, facial gestures can also tell you what the patient is experiencing. T stands for the timing as well as the triggers. And U stands for understanding, which means what does the patient understand about the pain? Have they done any home remedies or have they taken any over-the-counter medications to control their pain levels? So this is how PQRSTU method is performed to evaluate and assess in detail the patient's pain level. Also remember that pain is a subjective phenomenon. This means that pain cannot be directly observed, but it can only be experienced. So the nurses have to rely on what the patient experience is and go by what the patient is describing. Lastly, we will be reviewing the blood pressure monitoring. Blood pressure monitoring can be done by two methods. One is the manual blood pressure method. Second is the electronic blood pressure monitoring. Let's review the manual blood pressure method first. Always make sure that you ask the patient to sit up straight with their arms stretched forward and the patient's palm should face up. And the arm in which their blood pressure will be taken should be slightly bent. The upper arm should be level with the heart and the feet should remain flat on the floor, not crossed during the process. Some patients may wish to rest their arm on a table or arm rest for added support while having their blood pressure taken. Make sure that the patient is relaxed and calm before proceeding. First, estimate the systolic blood pressure measurement so that you will avoid missing auscultatory gap. This is the abnormal silence that can occur in some patients and it may cause you miscalculate the systolic number, which is the first sound heard. 
palpate the brachial artery with your first three fingers, it's found in the bend of the arm closest to the patient. Secure the cuff about two inches above the bend of the arm on the patient and line up the arrow of the cuff with the brachial artery. It's very important to use the correct size of the blood pressure cuff as blood pressure cuff comes in various sizes. Palpate the brachial artery again and inflate the cuff until you no longer feel the artery. The point where you no longer feel the artery on the gauge is the estimated systolic blood pressure measurement. Remember this number because when you take the blood pressure, you will inflate the cuff 30 millimeters of mercury above this number. Now deflate the cuff and wait for 30 to 60 seconds before you take the blood pressure. After waiting for about 30 to 60 seconds, palpate the brachial artery again and secure your stethoscope in your ears and place the bell or diaphragm of the stethoscope over the location of brachial artery. You can use either the bell or diaphragm of the stethoscope, however the bell is the best for assessing low pitch sounds. Inflate the cuff 30 mm of mercury above the estimated systolic blood pressure you obtained earlier. For example, if you estimated 90 as the systolic, inflate the cuff to 120. Then let the needle of the gauge fall about 2 mm mercury per second. The first sound you hear is the systolic number. The last sound you hear is the diastolic number. Once you note the diastolic number, deflate the cuff and remove it from the patient. Document your findings and what arm you measured the blood pressure in. Some key points to remember and very important can be tested on your NCLEX. Never ever take the blood pressure on the site which has pick line or shunts or fistulas. Also, do not take the blood pressure on the site of mastectomy. Those are the key and crucial important points which can be tested in your exam. Also, it's important to remember the normal value. So the normal systolic blood pressure value is 120 and diastolic is 80 millimeters of mercury. Hypertension stage 1 can be identified if the systolic blood pressure is between 130 to 139 or diastolic is between 80 to 89. Hypertension stage 2 can be identified if the systolic blood pressure is above 140 and diastolic blood pressure is above 90. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe to our channel for more clinical skill videos. Hello nurses and nursing students. I hope you guys enjoyed learning this amazing video of how to check the vital signs. And now you guys know what's next. Next is practicing NCLEX style question associated with the skill. So here is the first question on your screen. A nurse is caring for a client with the following consecutive blood pressure readings. 156 by 95 millimeters of mercury, 158 by 99 millimeters of mercury, and 157 by 96 millimeters of mercury. Which intervention should the nurse complete first? So here are the four options on your screen. Again, I want you to pause here and think for yourself which one is the right answer before I discuss. All right, guys, so let's just begin with option number A. Administer Ramipril medication 30 minutes earlier than the scheduled time. What do you guys think about it? All right, guys, so option A is actually correct because the priority is to lower down the blood pressure and it is reasonable to administer the medication 30 minutes prior and that's okay. Specifically, this medication you guys know is ACE inhibitor and this will help in lowering down the blood pressure of your patient. So now you would say, okay, Taryn, we already know option number B and C and D is incorrect. However, it's always good to review. Let's just review option number B. Provide teaching about lifestyle changes, including weight loss and dietary changes. Of course, you know, that is incorrect because teaching can be done later. That's not something which you immediately want to do. Once the blood pressure is controlled, then you can think about those things. Option number C, administer the RP. Option number C, administer the PRN as necessary nitroglycerin. Okay, guys, option number C is incorrect because nitroglycerin would not be used PRN for blood pressure control. It lowers down the blood pressure because of vasodilation for the management of angina, but not actually in controlling the hypertension. 
All right, now let's just look at option number D. Immediately repeat a full set of vital signs, including blood pressure. What do you guys think? That is incorrect because three blood pressures have already been taken and the fourth one is not required. It is time for an imp it is time for an intervention to be implemented. I hope you enjoyed this question. Let's just move on to the next question. Here is the next question on your screen. The nurse is preparing to take the vital signs on a client who was newly admitted. Which of the following actions should the nurse take to ensure an accurate blood pressure measurement? Here are your four options. So again, pause it and see for yourself which one is the correct option before I discuss. Option number A, use a large cuff on the client's arm. What did you guys learn in the video? That is incorrect. Using the appropriate cuff size is very important to measure the accurate blood pressure. Select the blood pressure cuff appropriate to the size of the client. The cuff should be snug and not tight. The cuff bladder should encircle at least 80% of the client's arm. That's how you choose the correct blood pressure cuff. All right, let's just look at option number two. Position the client's arm at the level of the heart. What do you guys think about it? That is the correct option, guys. This is important for obtaining an accurate blood pressure measurement. This orientates the artery being listened to for the blood pressure at the level of the heart, reducing the risk of inaccurate measurements. All right, now let's just look at option number three or C. Take the blood pressure in the dominant arm. Hmm, you guys must be thinking, okay, maybe, but that's incorrect because ideally the blood pressure should be taken in each arm and be documented. Taking the blood pressure in the dominant arm can result in higher blood pressures. Let's just review the last option. Take the blood pressure immediately after the client exercise. I hope you watch the video again carefully. That is incorrect because this can result in an inaccurate blood pressure reading. Ideally, the client should be resting in a chair for five minutes before having the blood pressure checked. Client should be reminded to wait at least 30 minutes after exercising, using tobacco or drinking coffee before taking their blood pressure. All right, are you guys ready for the next question? I think I am too, hey? Let's just move to the next question. Here's the next question on your screen. When taking a client's vital sign, which of the following should the nurse do first? Remember what I talked about. Pay attention to these keywords in your NCLEX first, next. So let's just review those four options. Again, pause your screen and see for yourself which one is the right answer. All right, guys, option number A, position the client comfortably. This is incorrect. This is not the first step. The nurse should take in in this situation. Option number B, perform hand hygiene. And that is correct because you guys know this is always the first action of the nurse. Option number C, explain the procedure to the client. Again, this is not the first step. Nurse will do the hand washing and then probably explaining the procedure to the patient. Option number D, prepare the necessary equipments. Again, this is incorrect because this is not the first step the nurse should do. Again, hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. Remember, this always comes first. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed learning clinical skill as well as NCLEX style question practice. That's what we do at FPNPC. We are always here to support the students and make sure you contact us if you have more queries. Please like and subscribe to our channel. And if you like this video, share it with your friends. Thank you very much.